Hi, everyone. Before I begin, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm giving my talk on unceded Gadigal land and would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Thank you all for coming to this year's CAA Australasia Conference. Thank you to Tom for organising this session and thank you for coming to my talk this morning. My name is Simon Wyatt Spratt and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Sydney. My talk this morning reviews how archaeologists have been using 3D modelling technologies to study stone artefacts. This talk is essentially a very early draft of a paper, and while I've been collecting and collating the data for this presentation for a few years now, the analyses are all very preliminary, so constructive feedback is particularly welcome. Before we go any further, let's get some quick definitional, definitional issues out of the way. By lithic technologies, I'm referring to stone artifacts, objects such as flakes, cores, retouched flakes, and ground stone artifacts made by humans or our ancestors and near relatives. And by stone tools, I mean objects used, but not necessarily intentionally shaped, like anvils, hammer stones, or grinding stones. I'm also including napped glass artifacts from recent colonial contexts and experimental and ethnographic, and ethnographic assemblages, as well as archeological ones. So what do we mean by 3D modeling? There are currently two main technologies used to create 3D models of stone artifacts. The first is scanning, both laser and structured light, and the second is photogrammetry. There are important differences in how these technologies work, which we don't have time to go into today. But the key difference between models made by these methods is that scanning will just capture the morphology of the object, whereas photogrammetry will also capture the texture. While scanning and photogrammetry are the two most common methods of making models, they're not the only ones. Coordinate measuring machines and computed tomography scanning have both been used in the past, but have essentially been superseded by scanning and photogrammetry, at least for the moment. So now we know what we're talking about, but why should we care? Firstly, there's a view held by stone art artifact specialists that 3D modeling has the potential to revolutionize the discipline. I really want to emphasize this. These technologies have been repeatedly described as revolutionary, as the titles of the papers by Grossman, Schott, and Magnani et al. indicate. And while none of the pap papers are exclusively about 3D modeling and lithic analysis, they are all written by people with a strong background in lithic analysis and all have major case studies which use 3D modeling to analyze stone artifacts. If qualitative reasons aren't enough for you, let's have a closer look at the quantitative ones. Since the earliest peer-reviewed published paper that I've been able to find in 2002, there have been at least 190 peer-reviewed papers and edited chapters which utilize 3D modeling in some way or another to illustrate or analyze stone artifacts, and it's mostly the latter. And that number has been increasing steadily since 2015, and 2021 is on track to be a record year, even with COVID impacting the last 18 months of research. And as far as I've tried to be with creating my data set, it feels like every week I find another paper or another research team that has been using this technology. There's at least two other talks today using 3D modeling to analyze lithics, both of which I'm really looking forward to hearing. And thirdly, it's now almost 20 years since the first paper looking at applying 3D modeling to lithics was published, and there's yet to be a review specifically focusing on this topic. As I said, all those reviews describing the technology as revolutionary all included major case studies involving lithics, but none of them are exclusively about them. So there's a gap in the literature, and after 20 years of study, the field feels right for review. So the initial data set of papers um, and book chapters um, include 180, 180 peer-reviewed papers and 10 chapters from edited books. This doesn't include theses or preprints, which would increase the numbers um, uh, fairly significantly. An initial data set was produced using um, searching academic databases, such as Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar, to identify papers using keywords. More useful, but significantly more time consuming, was going through the publications of individual authors who had at least one 3D modeling stone artifact paper and searching for other papers where they also utilized it. Following up on papers that they have cited or looking at the papers that cited them was also productive. And just to be clear, even though I have almost certainly missed papers and chapters, I'm reasonably confident that this data set represents the bulk of the extant li literature. Uh, one issue with the data set is that it's biased towards English language publications. For better or worse, English is the current lingua franca in academia, and the majority of peer-reviewed archaeological work is published in English, but there is still being important research done in other languages, and I don't want to overlook that work. Research applying 3D modeling to lithic assemblages has been published in Mandarin, Italian, Japanese, Russian, and Spanish, and undoubtedly other languages that I've not been able to locate. 
Overall, out of a total of 190 papers and chapters, 174, just over 90% are in English. Regretfully, I've chosen to exclude papers and chapters in languages other than English because one, I'm less confident that I've got the complete or near complete corpus of them. And two, because I'm more likely to misinterpret their content. So with the remaining 174 papers, let's start with a little social anthropology about who is doing these studies and where they are doing them. We look at the affiliations of first authors. What came as a surprise to me when I started collecting this data was that several countries are really punching above their weight. The USA coming in at number one is to be expected, but Israel and Australia have been really enormous contributors to countries with comparatively small populations. And what I think this reflects is the establishment of 3D modeling labs at specific universities. In this case, we can be quite specific. We're talking about the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the University of Queensland. It also demonstrates um, the distribution um, of research across the map is that even with costs coming down, 3D modeling is still an expensive undertaking with most research is being based in institutions in countries with high GDPs. I would also argue that the bias in the data set towards English, lang English language papers is why both Japan and Russia have few papers and to a lesser extent, the same can also be said for Italy and Spain. Uh, what's more interesting is that when we compare these figures to the countries of origin to the stone artifacts and assemblages being studied, uh, first thing to note is that studies with an experimental component, so non-archaeological, are the most common. Secondly, we can see that there's a much wider range of countries represented. Some research institutions have focused on local projects, Israeli institutions being the standout, but also Italian and Spanish. Other countries have a tendency for international or experimental research, most notably Australia, which despite institutionally having the second highest number of papers, has only four local studies. Other countries have a target of inter international researchers, such as India and South Africa. There are also some clear gaps. Australia, Central and South America, Central, West and North Africa, Central and Southeast Asia have few or no studies, while lithic assemblages from Southern Africa, North America, South Asia and Western Europe have been a focus of research. Some of the geographic distribution of the studies starts to make a little bit more sense when we look at what sort of material has been focused on. When you notice um, when, what you notice when you're going through the literature is that there are two classes of artifacts that I would argue are being disproportionately studied, hand axes and points. Over a quarter of the 3D modeling studies include um, uh, hand axes or bifaces or LCTs, whatever your preferred term is. And they are responsible for most of the studies from Southern and Eastern Africa, Western and South Asia, as well as a significant number of the studies from Europe. About 11% of papers have focused on points which doesn't sound quite as impressive. When you think about how these are a fairly specific artifact type, which generally represent a very small percentage of any given living assemblage, um, the context kind of indicates that they're you know, quite overrepresented. The prevalence of point studies reflects a lot of North American research with just over 60% of US studies, including points um, in their research. One point that I should mention is that these raw numbers are a little misleading um, down on the bottom right. So they don't reflect the total number of artifacts analyzed in a, a, each study. Um, they just represent whether a study does or does not have that class of artifact. Um, and truth be told, it's often not very easy to find out exactly how many uh, artifacts are being modeled and then analyzed. Some our studies have hundreds of artifacts. Other studies have focused on a single artifact. And I'm currently working on getting the data uh, for each paper in, into the data set. What I suspect is that this will actually increase the overrepresentation of both points and hand axes, as there is an increasingly large number of la increasingly large number of multi-site comparative studies focusing on these artifact classes. So while 3D modeling technology might have revolutionary potential, it's being used in studies that focus on what lithic analysts for over a hundred years have typically focused on. Classes of artifacts that are generally described as being standardized. And while there's nothing wrong with looking at that kind of material, it often only makes up a small percentage of lithic assemblages. So we have an idea of what people are doing with this research and what sort of stone artifacts they're looking at. What are they actually doing with the models? The most common use, just about, just at just about 22% of all studies, is for illustrative purposes. And when I've listed study as a study as using a model for illustrative purposes, I mean that they are exclusively used for illustrative purposes. The paper does not use them for any analysis, just as an alternative or an addition to 
uh, an archaeological illustration or photograph of the artifact. Interestingly, it's only in the last seven years that this has become common, uh, which I think reflects a reuse of 3D models that were created and analyzed in earlier studies and now being repurposed just as a way of illustrating lithic assemblages. Geometric morphometric studies are the next most common use of models. Just under a fifth of studies use it in one way or another. Unsurprisingly, these studies have been targeted towards artifacts that are perceived as having regular repeated shapes, so hand axes, points, and other retouched flakes. Multi-site and even multi-regional geometric morphometric studies are becoming more common, reflecting that there's a growing corpus of 3D models to be compared with and um, contrasted with from across the globe. One new trend is the use of 3D modeling for functional studies. The earliest paper is from 2018, and there's now a total of 10 publications that I've been able to find. They generally focus on macroscopic features and often feature an experimental component to their study. These studies have primarily looked at non-artifactual materials, such as hammer stones, grinding stones, and anvils. Compared to the modeling of other types of archeological material, there has been comparatively little published work discussing questions about how models of stone artifacts could be used for teaching, conservation, and repatriation. It's not that I think that these questions aren't being discussed by lithic analysts, but I think that the current focus is primarily on the potential of these 3D modeling technologies to answer archeological questions, rather than how they might revolutionize the way we teach lithic analysis, or how we might conserve and protect archeological landscapes where stone artifacts are present and how, where, and whom controls collected lithic assemblages. One final thing I'd like to discuss is how this field of research relates to itself. So these last few slides are presenting some very, very preliminary bibliometric analysis. Bibliometric analysis is essentially a quantitative way of mapping a body of academic literature. This analysis was carried out in R with the package Bibliometrics. The data set used for the bibliometric analyses is slightly different to the one previously discussed. To generate a data set to analyze, you need to export your corpus of papers metadata from databases such as Web of Science or Scopus. The problem is, is that not all journals have been listed by these platforms, and there can also be delays in getting new papers listed. This, is particularly, this particularly impacts smaller journals, newer journals, and also journals in languages other than English. Manually, add, manually adding papers is possible, though time consuming. I am partly through the process of editing my data set to incorporate you know, the papers that I'm currently missing out on. So it's a smaller data set and it's more about 130 papers as opposed to uh, 174. At a basic level, we can identify uh, using this technology, we can, uh, we can identify key academics, when they've published, how much they've published and how often they're being cited. Again, this kind of reinforces, if we look at it, reinforces the idea that 2014, 2015 was the year that publications and 3D modeling and lithics really took off. And we can also see the prominence of academics affiliated with Australian and Israeli institutions. Um, the top three, uh, you know, the, up the top there are a perfect example of that. We can also begin to create an intellectual history of the field. What, which papers are being cited? Who's citing them? Creating a clearer picture of how the field developed, which papers were key in its development. Bibliometrics also allows you to get some very specific trivia. 10 years ago, these papers were being published in JS. These days, they're being published in JS reports. It's not super important, but it is useful if you want to know what journals to keep an eye on in the future to see um, new and um, upcoming research. Potentially, the most exciting aspect of bibliometrics is thematic um, mapping and networking, showing how the field clusters around particular themes, sites, methodologies, or modeling techniques. Uh, it's not there yet, though, in my analyses. This is a relatively small, relatively niche field to do a bibliometric analysis, uh, which often, if not typically, uses data sets of thousands or even tens of thousands of papers. Unsurprisingly, for a, a, such a small sample, thematic mapping of terms like technology, stone artifact, 3D, or site, found in author keywords or abstracts, isn't particularly helpful. They all just sort of cluster together. So part of creating a more complete data set for um, the bibliometric analysis is creating a more meaningful set of terms to do this kind of analysis for. So I've hopefully made a case that there has been some really interesting research in this field and that there have been some archeological problems that have greatly benefited from the adoption of 3D modeling technology, but also that there are some pretty clear gaps, gaps where much work remains to be done. So what can we conclude? Has 3D modeling revolutionized lithics yet? Well, not yet. I think we're still undergoing that process. 
But I think it will require us to look a little more widely at what, where, and how we can apply this technology. I think that it requires us to be a little more reflective on what the past 20 years of research looks like, so we can begin to imagine what the next 20 years will look like. But I think it's going to be an exciting few years for this field. Uh, so this talk will be uploaded to YouTube, so if you wish to find out where I got my images and quotes, you'll be able to pause this slide and then review them here. Thank you all for listening. If you want to get in touch with me about any research I may have missed, or if you have any other suggestions, uh, contact me at any of the links on screen. I would love to hear about your own research in this area. Thank you very much.